Diet in pajamas. All right, so welcome back. Um, my mobility is a little bit limited right now. You can probably see the little ears sticking up. I have puppers in my lap. Of course, now he's getting attention, so he's going to sit up. But today in Science of Pajamas, we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence for evolution. No, we're not going to get into too much detail on it because... I mean, we have a whole PowerPoint explanation and notes on it. So we are going to at least talk about it a little bit. And yes, hi. You can even use this little guy to help us. So one of the evidence for evolution is something called homologous structures. They are structures in the bodies of different organisms that um, develop the same way. They might have different uses but they develop the same way. For instance, in this guy, his arm, what we consider his forelimb, it actually develops the bones of it in much the same way ours does. We have the radia and, sorry, radius and ulna in the lower part here. We have the digits. And up here, we have the humerus. And even though the bones look different than ours and they have a different function than the Bones of our arm, we have the radius and ulna, the digits, we have the humerus. They still develop in the same way during embryonic development. So during, you know, when we think been fertilized and conceived and we're building our bodies, they develop their arm bones the same way we do. Yes, yes, yes we do, don't we? Yes we do. We're similar, aren't we? <laughs> Yes, yes, we are. We're similar. And same with other parts. Like, if you look at the legs of a dog, they have a femur up top. Then they have the um, fibula and tibula as the lower legs. And they have their digits, their toes. Those develop the same way our legs do. Same with their spine and their rib cages. They might look different, but they develop the same way. And before you start saying, yes, Komar, they're... Spines in their rib cages have the same function, so are they really homologous structures? Yeah, because they still end up looking different than ours do. And our limbs have different functions. For instance, I don't use these to walk. I don't. He does. Right, Riffy? Yes. Yes, he uses them to walk and look all cute, and sometimes I make him dance. Sometimes I make him dance. But these are not for holding or grabbing things or carrying things. He uses them for transportation, for mobility. Uh, he might, you know, use them to pin something down, but it's not like he's using his hands, his paws to grab things like we do with our hands or anything like that. So those are homologous structures. Even if you look at the development of bird wings, so in their wings, they actually do have digit bones and which are homologous to our finger bones. They have a humerus and they have the smaller radius and ulna, although in them it's a little bit longer. But again, they develop the same way as our bones, but they just have completely different functions. They use their forelimbs for flying. Bats use them for flying. I use mine for petting my dog. Um, even dolphins, I mean, they're, those little flippers, they have bones in them. They have little digit bones. And they have little, very tiny arm bones, too. And before you say, Miss Colmar, most of those are mammals. Okay, fine then. A toad. A lizard. And don't say snake, because you know, all know that's a special case. But they have bones similar to ours, and they, like, they're arm bones. They grow and they develop the same way ours does. They just take on a different shape and thus a different function. Um, let's see. We also have these things called vestigial structures. So they are organs or structures in the body that have no use today, but are probably what we call evolutionary leftovers. Meaning that way back, in the old, 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 long ago, we had this, the functional ability for this 
particular structure or organ. But as we changed and adapted over time as a species, we no longer need it. For instance, wisdom teeth. We really don't need them. In fact, most people who do have them, who, where they actually grow out, most people have to get them removed. It's believed that those are a vestigial structure from when our mouths were protruding a little bit more, when we, our jaws were a little bit longer out. I'm not saying all the way out like a dog's snout, but when it was a little bit further out, when we, our faces kind of had more of that primate look, we had more room back there, and the wisdom teeth would have come in and helped grind up the rest of the food before it being swallowed. Well, since we don't have that, we have the rather small jawline. I mean, it doesn't really protrude that far from the rest of our skull. We no longer have the um, this room, the space for the wisdom teeth. So as a result, most people, if they do develop, they have to get them removed. They have to have them surgically taken out. And what we're also starting to notice as another evidence for evolution is that more and more people are being born without them or maybe they don't have all four maybe they only have two that come in and some people i've met some people who never had their wisdom teeth come in at all so that's one thought of a possible small evolutionary piece of evidence it's not a big change like you know jaw out to here no it's right here but it's still possibly showing how these vestigial structures, once no longer needed, they can be just set aside. Now, they don't necessarily need to disappear because really the traits that hinder survival are the ones that are going to be weeded out of the gene pool. They don't help us to survive, the wisdom teeth, but they also, because of our modern medicine, they don't hurt our chances for survival. It's not like, you know, if we had no opportunity for surgery to get them out, if we just let them come in and it caused pain, then we wouldn't be able to eat. And then if we couldn't eat, we probably would starve. But since we have the ability to remove them, then they don't hurt our survival, which is why they, we call them evolutionary leftovers. They don't hurt our chances at survival. They don't help them. They're just kind of like, Eh, they're just hanging out. Um, another example. Whales are, you know, big things that swim in the ocean. Let's draw a whale up here. We got there's our whale. Now, as you might expect, and we already talked about how there are, you know, we have the spine in it, we have the skull, we have the rib cage, and we've already talked about how there's also arm bones and digit bones. We probably know that they also have a pelvis. But did you know, even though they don't have legs, they have a little bit of a femur. Why would they have a femur if they don't have legs? Well, it is believed that in terms of their massively back, 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 way back in the day, ancestral species, they left the water, they crawled on land, they survived on land, and then some generations later, they went back and to the water and adapted to water life again. We don't know the circumstances of that, um, but that is believed to be the case. And that's why they still have the femur bone. It's an evolutionary leftover. They don't need it. They do not have the ability to to walk on hind legs. They don't even have hind legs. Yet, they have a leg bone back there. 
again, it's just a leftover vestigial structure from when they used to, when their ancestors used to survive on land. So that's what we mean by vestigial structures. All right. And then the next one we're going to talk about is the fossil records. So we've actually looked at fossils. We can date them to certain time frames. And what we notice is that we can actually kind of track the evolutionary um, voyage, I guess, of how a species or, an or, or a species adapts over many, 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 many years and becomes a new species. What I mean by that, I'm going to grab my notebook here and show you guys a picture right there. So this is showing all the way here is what they believe is an ancestor for the modern horse. Then all the way on this side is the leg of a modern horse. Now what you can kind of see is, yeah, let me readjust this, I'm sorry. What you can kind of see is over time, now if you just look at the beginning, yeah, and the end product, very different. But if you look in between, you can kind of see, okay, the toes are shrinking, the middle toe is becoming more pronounced and bigger, and we can see again, just the overall change, how it's a gradual change, and how that gradual change over time shows us how, okay, instead of just looking at from that to so if that's the case, they don't look the same. But by showing the increments, the species that are in between there, we can see how, okay, over time, this one, the outer toes got less pronounced. And the middle one starts getting bigger and it's getting larger. So it just kind of allows us to see how the changes occur over time. Now, something I think is really cool, if anyone is in the D.C. area, I don't know how widespread this is. I know my kids are in the D.C. area because, well, <laughs> but if anyone's in the D.C. area and you go to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, they have this case of like over 30 skulls from our ancestral or ancestors, our ancestor species. And it starts off with one that looks very much animalish. So a very, very, very animal type skull. I'm, I'm not even gonna try and draw that. One that you would never think would is related to us. And then at the very, very end is modern humans. Again, when you just look at the First and the last one, you see huge differences. You're like, there's no way that can become this. But when you look at all the steps in between and see the small amounts of incremental change that occur, then you start to see how one can become the other. Kind of like if you look at just a seed. If you n never saw a tree before, you saw a little tiny seed, saw a big tree, like there's no way those can be the same thing. But then you see this little root come out and then the little tiny leaves and then it gets bigger and now you got a sapling and bigger and bigger over time when we look at those incremental stages that's how we can use the fossil record to help us with um what's my cause it sorry <laughs> to help us with the um evidence for evolution and last one i'm going to talk about is something called dna evidence so m many of us have seen in different shows like um, Law and Order, Criminal Minds, CSI, how they can take DNA from two different people, run them through a process, and they can actually compare and see if those two people are related. 
Well, it's not just with people. They actually do that exact same thing with different species. For instance, um, well, the process is called gel electrophoresis. So how it is, is you set it up. And you have wells on one side. So let's say this is, maybe we found a new species of fish or new species. And we want to find out what kind of other fish is it evolutionary close to? What are its cousin species? So we can take samples from species A, B, C, and D. Maybe it's trout, bass, bluegill, and oh, minnows. I'm not really a I don't know. And what they do is they um, pair the DNA samples, they use restriction enzymes to chop it up, and then they'll put the DNA in these wells. Now this is a agarose gel, and what they'll do is they'll actually run a um, current through, an electric current, and it's going to pull the DNA down. Now remember, the DNA has been chopped up. And what it will do is, the larger the pieces of the DNA, the heavier they are, so they won't move as far. The current's not gonna be able to drag it across the gel. The smaller pieces are much lighter and they'll be able to be dragged farther across the gel. So let's say maybe we see, we got these there, 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 for our new species. And then for Species A, we have it here, and here, and here. For species B, we have here, here, here. And then we have, for species C, we have here, 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 here. And then for species D, we have here, here, and here. Now again, this kind of looks similar to some of the things you've seen on crime shows, because we can also do this to figure out paternity. The more of these sections that two people have in common, the more closely related they are. And it's the same thing with looking at it in terms of trying to figure out which species are closely related. Now, I know you guys are looking at more straight on. I'm looking at it to the side. So if we kind of draw these across, right. so these are the ones that the um, new species have. So if we look at this, we have one, two pieces in common there. We have one, two, three pieces in common with species B. One, two, three, four pieces in common with species C, and one piece in common with species D. So what this tells us, in terms of evolutionarily, the new species of fish is most closely related to species C. They have the most DNA in common, which means they are the most closely related. It's not saying they're the same species. It's like um, looking at dogs and wolves. We can actually run their DNA, and we can see how closely related they are. And then if I run dog DNA against a lion's DNA, I'm going to see a lot less involved, a lot less um, in common between the two. So C is the closest evolutionary relative. And then would be B, because it's got three in common. So that's the next closely related one, then A, then D. So it just kind of gives us an idea of 
how closely different species can be related by looking at the amount of DNA they have in common. We can also use that when we do classification, but we'll get to that in another video. All right. So those are the four main types of evidence for evolution. I hope it was educational. I know it's also hard for me to really fully demonstrate it up on my little dinky whiteboard, but there are some great videos um, using animations out there as well. So anyways, I hope this was educational. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, you guys stay healthy.